snooch to the moon! You gotta Hi, welcome to Lee County, Mississippi. Elvis Presley's birthplace, king of rock and roll, also home of Rumors Nightclub, the only gay bar in Northeast Mississippi. Shannon is small, been around since the early 1800s. Uh, Mr. Shannon came from Ireland here, and uh, everyone here knows everybody else. And if you come into this town, people will make you welcome. They're friendly people. Just kind of laid back and we live a little slower than most people. But we've got a nice, close knit community. We really do. It's one of the few small towns we've actually found that actually has a gay bar. Some people don't approve of it. But again, I tell you, this is a free country. And as long as they don't fear anybody else's rights, then they have the right to be there. Been living in Mississippi all my life. I was born and raised here. There's a lot of gay people here, and there's nothing for them here. So the opportunity arose, and I, I jumped on it. Um, my primary motto when I opened the bar was, it's here for everybody. I don't care if you're gay, straight, black, white, male, female, whatever. As long as you come here to have fun and you respect everybody else's right to have fun, that's what it's here for. That's what we're here for. We want everybody to know that this is a place you can come and hang out. You can have fun with gay people. Gay people are just like everybody else. It's a little bit difficult. They know I own a bar. My family all knows I own a bar, but they don't know that it's a gay bar. Um, they don't know that I'm gay. I've never told um, anybody in my family. Um, my, my parents are Pentecostal, and I know they love me and accept me, but if I told them that, I don't think they could ever accept that. So I choose to keep that secret. This was first grade. I think I was six or seven. Everybody looks at that picture and says, yeah, your parents should have known you were gay. Makes it a little bit difficult when I go to visit my family because I have to keep the biggest part of myself secret. You know, I can't tell them, you know, how my love life's going, what's going on with my family, my friends, that kind of stuff. But it's a choice I make to protect them, make it easier for them. Uh, I don't make a whole lot of money, but that's not, that's not the focus. You know, if, if I was here for the money, you know, I wouldn't be here. Mississippi would not have been my choice. I was born here. I'm here now because one, I own the bar, and two, I have a great job. As far as being gay in Mississippi, it's hard. It's very hard. Everybody is welcome here. And 
everybody that comes here, they feel like they're part of our family because that's the way we want it to be. It's like there's other bars around here that don't make you feel welcome at all. That bar down there has techno music and it's just different. Rumors? Yeah. Ah. Those queers don't fuck with me, I ain't gonna fuck with them. They fuck with me, I'm gonna bust the head wide open. Why'd you ask me that though? I, you ask me a question, I'm gonna ask you a question. Why you ask me about rumors? Oh, they keep yourself, you know. I, I ain't getting nothing against it, but uh, I ain't for it. But. I don't like niggas. Use my language, I don't. You know, I don't judge anybody. Everybody has their own thing. They can do their own thing, you know. As long as they don't push it on me, that's fine. Blacks open the gay wall. Now, I've been in there, and yeah, there's several whites in there. It started off black. I personally would never set a foot in rumors, ever, as long as I live. in the home on rainbow don't be afraid to let your color shine yeah you don't find many gay bars especially in small towns and uh, to have a bar like this is really relieving uh, I come every Thursday that's pretty that's much it, it. he yeah. comes with me he's stuck with me I was ecstatic to be in a place with gay friendly people I felt right at home Right now, this is the only bar that uh, in Lee County that I know of uh, that I can come and be myself. Uh, you can't be yourself in a regular bar. I think at a straight bar, they feel a little uncomfortable with you just letting it all out, you know. If you find your body gold, I mean, I'm just like every ordinary person. I work 40 hours a week, and this is my stress reliever. I come out here and have a few beers, and it's it's basically like a cubby hole. You know, you escape here, you uh, you're you're free to let down your hair, and you're free to be whatever you want. And then Monday through Thursday or Friday, you go back to your regular job, work at a factory. Uh, associate with all these other straight men and say, yeah, yeah, it's okay, I'm cool, yeah, that's a funny joke about the women, yeah, yeah, yeah. But on the weekend, the weekend belongs to us here. I mean, there's no better party in town, you know, I mean, there's there's a couple of straight bars, there's a couple of people's houses you could go to and hang out, but come on, you come up here, you have a great time, you see a great performance with all these beautiful bitches. bitches. <laughs> <laughs> Many colors in the homo rainbow Show me yours, I'm gonna show you mine I'm the show director here at Rumors. I've worked here um, for about nine years. It has its good nights and its bad nights. Um, being from a small town, a lot of people are basically in the closet. Um, <laughs> So we have some slow nights, and then we have our really good nights. Um, it can be tough at times. Um, of course, we're in the middle of the Bible Belt, so, you know, there's a lot of name calling, but I chose to live this life, so I know there are repercussions with that decision. Um, the bars kept me really kind of active. Um, I also work full time at a vet's office in Tupelo as a receptionist, so, you know, it's kind of my escape from reality, I guess you could say. Animal Care Center of Tupelo, this is Jim. How can I help you? Hey. That's one thing I try to keep separated is my professional right. from my personal. I actually work at another vet clinic also, and there's been a couple of questionable things said to me up there. There have been some comments made that they're going to convert me and everything. They've said they're going to pray for me and they're serious and everything else. I work for a bunch of Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to say about that. This was a Stephen Urich evening gown that I no longer have. Somebody has. And if y'all see this gown anymore, could you please call me? It's a $2,000 gown. Um, 
This may don't even look like me, does it? This is my drag mother, Vanna Valentino. This is my Me Against the Music outfit. It's very similar to the one she wears in the video. And Me and Baby Holiday. If you look very closely, you can see that she stuffs her titties with socks. I used to look on falsies from Victoria's Secret. Y'all had a Mexican Tremont is not a city, bitch. That is not even... <laughs> she says she went to Tremont City Limit School. They have a post office. <laughs> so I started May 21st of 1997. That was my very first show. And I haven't stopped since. Every weekend. If I went a weekend without it, I just felt like I was going into DTs or something. Just gotta go to the bar. I've gotta go to the bar. Gotta put a wig on. When did you come out? When I was 13. I decided it was time. I was like, well, there's no hiding this anymore. So I started wearing purple silk shirts and short cutoff shorts and it was all over. People were not accepting. I mean, some were, but generally they were all just really assholes about the whole thing. My entire school experience was nothing but one hateful remark after the other and I finally at 16 I was just like I'm tired of this I'm tired of it after so long after you know well 26 years of it you just I got immune to it I just quit letting it bother me really I just have this whole you know if you don't like me fuck you go fuck yourself <laughs> rumors that was the good. As soon as I turned 18, I went and decided I was going to start drag. And I was fine after that. There were other people that had been through the same shit as me. Yeah, it was like my second home. Still uh, is. I worry about him all the time. Um, I don't think people realize it's hard to come out in a small town. I watched my brother struggle for years and years. It was really hard. And when he finally did, um, of course, it just... You know, it's like all hell breaks loose. Everybody looks at you and whispers and talks. I understand, you know, that, that she loves me and, and she's worried about me. It's not necessarily my choice to be the way that I am, but I'm going to be accepting of it and be myself. If there wasn't a gay bar, there would be no kind of gay community. It would just be a bunch of fags, drunk, sitting at the local bar. And I don't consider it just a gay bar. It's a getaway. There's a lot of acceptance there. It, to me, it's more like a, a safe place at rumors. It doesn't matter who you are, you know you're accepted. It's like you walk in and it's family. That's, that to me, that's what it's like. You walk in and you're walking into family. I don't think that my life is any different than any other mate. I mean, I go to work every day. I don't try to hide my sexuality, but I don't flaunt it. Primarily, me and Elise have been together for about three years now, so it's become an every Thursday and Saturday thing. How did you two meet? Up here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was supposed to be a one night stand and it kind of turned into more. I had got here and I'd saw the show and done all that, and after the show, he approached one of my friends to approach me. and. He was Jim, not Alicia, and he come up and he was talking to me and everything, and we went to an after party, and it wasn't until the after party that I found out he was even a drag queen. I'd never come out until I was 19. I'd never been to the bar before. I was like, well, cool, I'll go, but at the time, I was hiding myself. I was still in the closet. I was trying to just keep to myself, and it wasn't until me and Alicia met that I pretty much came out of the closet full force. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in a small town. I mean, population is probably not even a thousand. And if you want to come out of the closet, you need to trust yourself. Be careful who you talk to. Your best friend could be your worst enemy. I've had to learn that the hard way, and that's the only advice I can give. Bite me, Brian. Come on, baby. But this right here is usually us whenever no bar, no work, no nothing, sitting in front of the TV. All four of them sleep with us at night. I'm the only guy in Lake County I know sleeps with five bitches every night. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Uh -huh. <laughs> time to be 
see here, and it's okay. It's a small town bar, but it's a place to go. It's just nice to get out where you don't have to deal with terrified heterosexuals. This area is bad. I mean, if you're gay, you're going to hell. And as far as I'm concerned, God made me just like he made everybody else on that road out there. Yes. I'm just happen to be smart enough to know what I want to do, and I got the biggest enough, big enough mouth to say, I don't care what you think. My name is Debbie Shutok, and you are in Lee County, Mississippi, just outside of the county seat, Tupelo. And to get here, you have to either follow me or follow smoke signals, or I have to pipe in sunshine to tell you where we are. <laughs> I've been here a little over a year and I didn't know where the bar was. I met somebody last week and said, well, meet me at the bar. And I said, that's fine. Where is it? And it's nice to have a bar in the area. I mean, you can go and have a drink. If you want to, if you see somebody you want to talk to, you can talk to them. You don't have to worry about being in the mall and who's going to see who and who knows what. A lot of people are still in the closet. A lot of people, because of where they work or what they do, cannot be out of the closet. You go to the bar, you don't have to worry about it because if they came in there, they probably know then what's in that bar needs to stay in that bar. And having some place to go like that, you got to have some kind of outlet. If you work hard and you don't get to play hard, then why are you doing it? Why bother? I worked real hard and I'm not playing nearly as hard now as I'd like to, but I saw a cute girl last night. We had a good dance and she said, see you again. I said, I'll give you a phone number. You can call me. Cast away on the front porch Broken and blue Black is the color of life after you And candles make the sacred heart beat Like the wings of old newspapers in the it, it's kind of scary, you know, like, um, that's like the worst thing about being a homosexual is you never ever know what type of person, how they're going to act toward the situation. You have so many people that are denying themselves their expressions, their abilities, their, their personality. These people are maroon dots in a black dot world. I mean, they are very different. They are almost inconceivably different. They can't be accepted by what we've been taught here. Lots of consequences. It's a consequence. You know, we have to take we take our chances on you no know, when we when we go through the mall, you know what I'm saying? We have to take our chances on people calling us fags and homos and saying that we have AIDS and all like that. But then, you know, when we come down here we still take our chances. We take our chance once we pull up on the parking lot, we take our chances on people shooting at us, throwing at us, you know what I'm saying? Once we make it inside that building right there, it's it's open. You just you, take you just chances, free. Anyway, you, know you take chances for holding what you are inside. Yeah, yeah. Because if you hold what you are inside, it hurts you more than when it is outside. Believe yeah, me. That's why yeah. I had to come out and tell him I'm gay. I'm a homo. I like and dick I love men. It. Happen to have them. Okay. And thanks. somebody that thinks they can make the world just all better and right according to their belief and their opinion and those are the type of people that are going to cause problems. There's some crazy out there, they're going to do something. Somebody's going to get hurt. That's what scares me. I keep waiting for the bomb to drop, you know. Something's, something's coming, it always does. 
Sunday was the last time family members of 18-year-old Scotty Weaver say they saw or spoke to him. 48 hours after the gruesome discovery of 18-year-old Scotty Weaver's body found burnt and decomposing in a wooded area, sheriff's deputies arrest three suspects for capital murder. 20-year-old Chris Gaines, 18-year-old Nicole Briars Kelsey, and 18-year-old Robert Porter. Scotty Weaver's murder, the source of intense sorrow, Baldwin County investigators' conclusion that the 18-year-old was killed in part because he was gay. Baldwin County investigators say Scotty Weaver was brutally killed in part the family and because friends from people who harassed him for his sexual orientation and his interest in dressing in drag. Step tell me. I says, Scotty, you got to realize what you're doing. I says, it's people out there will hurt you on stuff like that. His lifestyle may not have uh, set well with somebody else, and they just took care of him because of that I I just I I know how people don't understand and just because other people didn't approve of him they didn't give them the right to take his life or to hurt him Most everybody that knew him, knew him as a very outgoing person, knew him as someone you really couldn't be upset around, really. Um, he'd always have a way of making you laugh. Uh, he always had a great personality, um, very cheerful, and just someone that you just couldn't be around without knowing that you're, you, everything's going to be okay or that, you know, things are going to work out. From my experience, as well as my brother's, there's just so much persecution. I mean, I go to work every night, and I've got teenagers walking by the aisle that I work on, calling me names. Now? Right now, even though everything's that's been going on. Anti-gay group Westboro Baptist Church planning to protest Crossroads Church of God, where gay murdered teen Scotty Weaver's funeral was held. I hate fags. God hates fags is a serious, profound, theological statement. It's not okay to be gay. It's a sin. You're going to hell for it. You mean the family of these dead fags? I'm preaching to them. You killed them. You killed them. God Almighty gave you that little child and imposed upon you immediately a solemn duty to raise him in the, or her in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
and tell them what sin is and tell them what wrath is and tell them what the judgment day is certainly coming. Tell them what heaven is and tell them what hell is. They didn't do any of that. They encouraged them like the preachers in the churches they went, telling them God loves everybody and God loves you unconditionally. All that does is fan the flames of fag lust and hasten their demise. I'm the only one telling them the truth for God's sake. Look, I'm the only one that loves them. We go down like moles, claws digging in the soul. We descend on fours, our snouts lead us on. We fall down without notes, and so we build a barren mud. It's not just fags, it's also enablers of that sin. And in this country, that's darn near everybody. At what point did you begin speaking this message? It was because there's a, there's a park over here named Gage Park. We noticed when we go over there to jog or anything, our people would be over there that the fags had taken over the park and you couldn't go over there any time, day or night, would have them groaning and rolling around in the bushes. We tried for two solid years writing and appearing before the city council to get the city fathers to enforce the law. Man, if that had been some heterosexuals over there doing that, they wouldn't have allowed that. Didn't work. It was an epiphany. Uh, we thought if we make some signs, little signs after church on Sunday, you know, and go over there. See, that's the first little sign we made. You watch your kids gaze in the restroom. We thought it would get a little publicity, and that'd be all it'd take. You know, the community would... The opposite happened. We were the goats. You were vilified for that? Oh, mm -hmm. were we vilified? All hell broke loose. I mean, the fags rose up like this was Custer's last stand. They, they were bringing people in here from all over the Midwest. Every Sunday when we go over there, the crowds of fags got bigger and bigger and bigger. Finally, it was a, a riot condition every Sunday. Every Sunday. It became an institution and churches would bring kids with T-shirts, blasting me, Fred sucks, stuff like that. So we just flat out lasted them. We started picking in all the churches right where they were. We changed our church time to 11.30 on Sunday morning so we could pick at every mangy, fag-loving church in Topeka, Kansas before. We started the pickets about seven. And from that day to this day, we've been picking in those churches, still picking in those churches. They're out there putting hatred into the world, and that's not what God's about. Pure, absolute, asinine balderdash to question that God hates people. He doesn't send their sins to hell. He sends them. The judge, for God's sake, doesn't send the crime to the penitentiary. He sends the criminal. Jacob have I loved, saith the Lord such as Romans 9, 13. Esau have I hated. And it goes way past hate in the Bible. He abhors people. He despises people. And he says it over and over again. Now, that's good talk. Knowing my brother, knowing how he was, even though he get mad at people and everything, he never would hold a grudge against anyone. And that's one of my, one of my things that I just don't see why I, I need to hate anyone. And another thing, I can't kill hate with hate. I can only kill hate with love. And the most important point of his death and all the rest of them is that they're in hell now and if you want to live like that, you're going to go to hell and join them. And you'll cuss each other bitterly forever. It is not a civil right. It is not an innocent alternate lifestyle. It is a monstrous sin against God Almighty that will destroy your life and damn your soul. Man, when I started preaching this stuff, they all preached it like this. 
My old pal Billy Graham used to preach it like this. We went to the same Bible school, Bob oh, yeah. Jones, Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina, and we used to be rather, rather good friends. Not real close. I used to lead the prayer in his some of his crusades, like in Southern California. I wrote him the other day and said, "We're going to pick at your funeral, Billy. We're going to pick at your funeral." I believe that even though he was he was taken from this world, I believe that it was in God's plan. And the main reason I believe that is to make the gay community stronger in this area and make people wake up and realize that, you know, we can do things if we stick together. It's very hard being gay in this town. There's no, nothing for anybody that's gay, lesbian, to really do in this town. I mean, you know, if you don't want nobody to know, then you pretty much keep a life to yourself. Um, you stay pretty much inside. You don't go out much. Um, you don't do much of anything but just loneliness. You know, I'm from down around those woods, Mississippi and Alabama, and all my folks are there. Welcome to Meridian, Mississippi, birthplace of the Reverend Fred Phelps and home of Crossroads. Have you ever heard of a place called Crossroads? In Mer Mississippi? In, yeah, Meridian. In Meridian. A place. You mean for fags? I never judged anybody that come through my door. Uh, Whatever you were into, I would help you and go out of my way to find you what you were looking for. And regardless of sexual orientation, race, color, creed, religion, everybody could come out here and have a beer. A place to get away, you don't have to worry about the city scene. It was a really woodsy-like place where you could get out and you don't have to worry about being harassed. You don't have to be worried about anybody finding you there. If you didn't know where it was, you're not going to find it. Uh, gravel parking lot, there's no kind of advertising, you walk in and there's 300 people that are, you know, basically just like you. Straight, gay, lesbian, uh, truckers would pull up and park their trucks on the side of the interstate and come on down to the bar, grab them a beer. Everybody's welcome. Well, I thought it was like the coolest thing in the world. Uh, finally, you know, somewhere where I could be myself and where I wouldn't be judged. When I first started going there, it was absolutely wonderful. It's very nice to be able to go to a spot to where that, you know, you can actually t touch your partner in life and be somewhat relaxed. Uh, and it is extremely important to be able to do things like that. Uh, it makes you feel as if, you know, you are human and that you do fit in. As you first come in, there's a small bar that was there, and that was like the weeknight bar. And then on the weekends, he would open up the large bar, the dance bar, where everyone would go, you know, and dance. And somewhere in there in the middle, he had another smaller bar. So, I mean, he, he had a lot of things going on there. And the buses, now I have no clue what he was doing with the buses. <laughs> I see there were 17 buses like a stagecoach. Crossroads was going to become Crossroads Estates, and he was actually going to turn those into motel rooms. Uh, and he ripped a few of them out and, and put uh, beds down in them, <laughs> and there were going to be where, the, you know, if somebody was too drunk to drive, that they could, you know, sleep in the buses. You got you have a boxing ring in the center of all those buses. We had professional boxing. We had kick fights, kung fu. We had redneck 
Well, Rednick versus drag queen, wrestling matches. You know, a Marine versus a Navy, a uh, Marine versus a gay person, a uh, Marine versus a drag queen. Uh, you could have any boxing match out there you really want. <laughs> and we had the Choctaw Indians out there selling tacos <laughs> during these wrestling matches. Um, the catch of it is, is anything went out here, um, good or bad. You understood that when you worked out here, uh, so. It, it was a thing to expect out here, you know, anything goes. But it was one of the most fantastic place for anybody of any taste bud whatsoever. If you're going to be offended, you shouldn't be out here in the first place in the woods. You should go to a big city somewhere and sit back and act proper. Anything. Just basically anything could have happened. walk out and there's this guy that works for this gutter service. Uh, something like you'd find off Deliverance and not the ones in the canoe. He's naked with a beer bottle shoved up his rear end. And I look at him and just, I say, look, man, we don't open till six o'clock. You could see stuff here that you wouldn't see at any place else in the most X-rated porn movie you've ever seen. They were getting it on. <laughs> I think that it was uh, became desperate. I think that people wanted something, needed something, and then um, it just got tied in with a lot of desperation. Black lights and glow candle wax just melted over naked flesh all over the bar. Oh, um, must we really go there? <laughs> and maybe more and more people came out there, not so much to be there and mingle and have a good time, but as an oddity. Um, and that's the environment that it became a circus-like environment. Name what the gay community is. It stretches from one extreme to the other, just like heterosexuals. Uh, my place is to try to be friendly to everyone that's here, to accept everybody as they are, and not for what you want them to be, but for who they are. Every negative aspect that people or slurs or remarks people make about homosexuals and being gay was depicted out there. But how do you, how do you judge what was there? Uh, you just allowed them to be themselves, which was embedded in them, not me. I just gave them a, a uh, inside building to be able to achieve anything they wanted to. Became not necessarily a gay bar, but a very seedy um, place to be, and it, it had a lot of uh, trash and a lot of underage and things going on that... Um, people would commonly associate with the homosexual population. A lot of things happen out here, and it's nothing out of the ordinary. I mean, it's sad to say, it, but it's fun that you get used to it. I mean, nothing offends you out here. It was definitely rustic. Uh, at the same time, I could appreciate him uh, for all that he has done for the community here because no one else seemed to be able to do it. Uh, there was so much resistance in the city limits of Meridian uh, to where it was physically impossible because of cops and because of uh, gay bashings, and there were several. Uh, 
I've been arrested uh, many times uh, for uh, handing out uh, literature on uh, AIDS, and they put wrote it up as uh, contribute. Uh, I mean, contributing to delinquency of minors. Uh, I've been arrested for that. I've been arrested for handing condoms out in neighborhoods. <laughs> so the police department. Uh, uh, we're sitting there waiting on something to happen. They had closed the, uh, the local brothel down that had been in business for 60 years, and the next place to go was Crossroads. The only thing they could find to bust me on was I sent a boy that worked for me to pick up a trailer, and he went and stole one, come back, and we were bringing it back. It wasn't like we were stealing it, whatever, we were bringing this trailer back. And since it was attached to my truck, uh, it was a way they could get back at me. I know he had gotten in some trouble and went on the run. Well, I got up one morning, decided I wanted to go to Mexico, hand out to the other bar manager, gave him the keys to Crossroads and whatever. The next time you saw Butch was when he was being uh, shown on Crime Stoppers on the nightly news trying to find him. I was in Mexico, and they arrested me. Uh, on the Mexican border coming back in. And uh, they held me in jail in a Mexican jail for two months, which was hard. <laughs> it was hard. The only gringo, the only white boy in a Mexican jail, and they told me that was a miracle when I got out of it because they had never had a white guy survive in one. Got back here to Meridian, and when they got through with all this, they charged me a $1,200 fine. But they popped four years probation on me. For, for this little trailer bit. So the probation, does that, is that... That keeps ready? you from operating. When I got back, I'd walk back into my bars and everything in them was stripped. In two weeks, they had stripped everything in the bar totally out. But it's just like uh, that, then that nothing else could hit me any harder than that. And I said, screw it. All I want is to be in his mood and not just be old worms of yesterday. All I want is to be in his movie, and not just be old worms of yesterday. Uh, it's a tragic situation. It bothers me because, I mean, I can't even hold her hand anywhere in anyone's sight. That's how gay life happened out here. And now that we don't have a gay bar in this area, uh, you have to drive 90 miles to go to a bar, to a social scene. Welcome to the history of gay bars in Northeast Mississippi. Oh, Jesus. Get Cujo. <laughs> Tulip Creek uh, was the only gay bar I really knew in Tupelo. <laughs> There they go. First, it started out as just one big brick building. Then it opened up to a patio bar. Then another bar on the outside of it. Good night. It'd be about 125 people here. When the bar was in full swing, there was two security guards out here to tell you where to park. They had a caretaker that lived in the house over here. That were him and his lover, or whoever they were screwing at the time. There was a few buses parked around back that was used by the drag queens. And then there was another area on out here that, uh, just picnic tables and lawn chairs. And that's pretty much it. When the nights where we get raided, there'd be drag queens in full dress running across that field across there in high heels trying to clear a couple of barbed wire fences. So, you gotta hand it to them. They, if they didn't know how to dance, they knew how to fucking run. They got the hell out. Are we, 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 are we,
he was wanting to get uh, out of here, I think, and start up somewhere else because it was just getting that bad. And there was always people out here watching you. You could, as soon as you turned in on the road, you knew you was being watched. They shot through that house right over there. There's people inside the house and somebody opened fire on it. There's really no bar for the people to function at now. You took away our one spot. Caps and I'm sitting here at the old sugar shack. It was here back in 78. I was 17 when I first started coming here. And this place was hopping. I mean, it was just, I couldn't believe it. I didn't think there was that many gay people out until I came here. And the drag shows was awesome. Nothing was like this place. I mean, you couldn't get a parking space out here. They was parked up and down the road everywhere. And they just come from everywhere. Well, the way I found out was the best friend of mine told me about it. And he begged me for six months to come. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't want nobody to know it. And finally, I decided to come. And once I came, I was here from Wednesday to Saturday. <laughs> Bar was very important to me. I mean, I enjoyed myself here and met a lot of new people and realized that I wasn't the only one in the world. I f still feel a connection to this place because it was the first gay bar I ever went to. I miss it, I know that. I guess it's never gonna be like that anymore. That's where it all happens, out in the cars. When you pulled up, you see the car rocking, you just kept on walking. <laughs> These walls could talk. <laughs> they could tell you who got fucked and who didn't. Hi, we're at the American Family Association in Tupelo, Mississippi. I just know they're a big religious association. Um, they try to make sure that all the morals are kept up to date around the towns and everything, Northeast Mississippi. Well, we're a uh, national, what we call a pro-family traditional values organization. And we were started in 1977 by my dad, uh, Reverend Donald Wildman. And I've been here since 1986. And so we, well, we say we champion uh, uh, Judeo-Christian values in the in the in the popular culture. You know, we have a 170 station radio network called American Family Radio. We also have a magazine, the AFA Journal, which goes to about 160,000 poems. And then we have an internet presence, uh, a couple million people that have subscribed to our internet email alerts, and so we sort of encourage people to get involved in that way. So those are sort of the outlets that we have to get our message out. You have to balance uh, your own personal convictions based on why you, you know, the things you believe with another person's right to exist, to live their own life. And so that's why our actions at American Family Association are taken against groups who try to revolutionize the culture, not against individual gay people. Mm, well, I was at... Tulip Creek back when they were parking across the street from Tulip Creek. Who was parking across the street? Donald Wildman and some of his fellow church members. Got stopped on that bridge one night by a Christian coalition and wouldn't let us cross. They were writing down tag numbers. Of cars? Of cars. They was blocking the bridge. At that well, time it was just a one-lane bridge. The cross ties on the side of it to keep you in. Me and a DJ from New Albany had to ride the rail getting up and then just holler out our tag number because the next morning they'd renounce it on the radio. And you know, in a big city, there's a lot of anonymity. I mean, yes. you can sort of blend in, melt in. Nobody knows who you are. You can sort of live your... In a small town, there's more, I think, accountability for your life because a lot of people know you. They know your family. Uh, they know what you do. I'm told that they got addresses using these tag numbers and sent people letters in the mail telling saying that their 
vehicles had been seen at this gay establishment. The next morning, you'd hear the whole list. Sounded like somebody like Billy Graham would get on there and he'd say, oh, and uh, talk about the morning, how it went. And then they'd say, oh, and the following cars were spotted out on Tulip Creek Drive. Uh, and everybody knew in Tupelo that that's where this boy was. And basically would tell the whole world. And so I think to a certain extent that helps build community. That helps uh, people pitch in more. That helps people be more kind and courteous and respectful oftentimes of, of one another when uh, when you have that kind of in, 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 in environment. We'll either frighten you into staying home or cause enough trouble that they'll close the bar. I guess that's where they go and congregate and try to meet one another. That's an unfortunate uh, an unhappy group of people most of the time. Why do you think they're unhappy? Um, it's a very, very high rate of promiscuity. I don't know why they're unhappy exactly. I think they're spiritually unhappy. I, I would say there's, you know, but I would say there's a high level of promiscuity in the homosexual community, much greater than in the heterosexual community. And I, I don't know what that means exactly, so maybe they're looking for something or trying to find love or trying to find what they think is uh, acceptability. Uh, so that's why what, what I mean by a lot of sadness, a lot of, a lot of despair is what I've witnessed and what I've heard about in, the, in much of the gay community. I just want to know, who is he to say that there's something missing from our lives? I feel <laughs> that my life is complete. Right. You know, there's obviously something missing from their lives because they have nothing better to do than but sit around to, and criticize us. Yeah, we're, I'm with somebody that I love dearly who I've been with for three years. You know, we don't have children, but we've got five very beautiful dogs. All of them are purebred, by the way. Who's to, uh, you and know, what is the definition of family? There are heterosexual heter couples they can't who don't even have, have children. Kids. So, I mean, I'm going out, I'm doing what makes me happy deep down in my heart. I'm with the person I want to be with. I go home every night to a house that I know I'm secure in. You know, I go to work, I enjoy the people I work with. Who's to say that I'm not living a normal life just because I dress up in women's clothes or because I choose to be with somebody who's the same sex as I am? You know, it is my life. God put me on this earth, you know, to make my decisions. I'll have to answer to him. I need mm -hmm. what we need in the gay community is all these people out here making our that's trying to make our decisions for us. Mm -hmm. Let us be the grown adult taxpayers that we are and make our own decisions. Right. <clears throat> Girl. My take on the American Family Association. <clears throat> I don't like Don Wildman as far as I can pick him up and throw him, okay? I know some of his family. I think he's a hypocrite. You know, if you don't, if you don't agree with something, that's fine. But when you turn around and, um, I mean, if, I don't know what I can say here safely. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, he, there's a member of his family who is gay. There is? Yes, there is. Every family has skeletons in their closet. And for him to sit here and ridicule me when he's got it in his family, every family has it. No offense to the preachers out there because there are some really great preachers out there. Never, no, I didn't know. I knew there was a gay bar around here 15 years ago, but I didn't know that one existed even today. And I don't know, maybe, you know how in towns things get reputations. Maybe that's a singles bar over there and that's a gay bar over there and that's, Oh, it's been, it's been a gay bar for seven years. Yeah, well, you know, that's... I don't think, I think he was lying. There's no way he cannot have heard about that bar. He said uh, he never heard of rumors. Oh, really? Well, don't believe it. Whatever, they have been boycotting outside our bar. Now, that right there is a lie. Now, you tell me how Christian-like they oh, wait, are. stop. Is it lying a sin? Yes, yeah. lying's a sin. And aren't all sins equal? So, I guess that makes yeah. them right in the same boat as we are. They're going to heal oh, yeah, they 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 your hand basket. I've been in the business for a little over six years, and it's one of those, it's kind of like dog years. I feel like I've been in it for 42 years. Uh, I've recently had the opportunity to, to sell the bar, which I'm actually entertaining doing. Um, what do you think would happen if the gay bar didn't exist anymore? I mean, we've all made a lot of good friends up here, and I just believe that would separate a lot of the friendships, and it'd be harder on new people trying to come out of the closet. I think there'd be a void just because this is most people's outlet. There'll be a lot of mad drag queens. <laughs>
me being Wait. one. <laughs> I just hope I have a job. Yes, week. really. I mean, without this bar, where would we go? Well, there would be a lot of people driving to Memphis every weekend. I'll tell you that, making that hour and a half, two hour drive. I don't think I could handle it. The gay population would suffer. It will hurt us. And in if, general. If we didn't have this place, we wouldn't have an outlet. You know what I'm saying? It's so much to, for him to go to work every day. If he couldn't come here on Thursdays and Saturdays, where would he let okay. it out at? I think I'm I mean, going to be able to work on Fridays. Once he punches <laughs> his time clock, he has to be Lawrence. <laughs> Lawrence. But when he comes down here, he can be Miss Lawrence. Okay. You know. Yeah. <laughs> you have to deal with the, uh, the fact that, yes, it could go uh, into a straight bar. Or, I, or it could be uh, dismantled entirely and not leave us anywhere for us to go. The rejection of a gay culture would probably be the most devastating to us. Stuff's been going on in my head in the last couple of weeks. It, it just struck. It was like I went out of the bar and I'm either going to sell it or close it. And Lena and Mark expressed an interest, and when they did, it just was like, okay, here's what I've always wanted. And they said they wanted to buy it, and I was like, let's go, let's do it. Make me an offer. I won't turn it down. I think I'm leaving a pretty big part of me behind. Um, you know, six and a half years, I put my mark on it. Um, I hope it's a positive mark that everybody will remember for a while. shut down about a year and a half and uh, I had quit going out there and hadn't been out there since it shut down. Uh, one afternoon I decided I'd ride out and just just check it out and uh, I just something in me said I gotta have it. I said to myself a few times, you know, if I could ever, any way possible, ever get my hands on this place, I would do it right, you know, maybe I could do something with it. I just want to try to change it and make it a brighter and happier place and a nicer place and a nice, respectable, clean place for people to go. Well, time and money and, and hard work and it's going to be back and it's going to be better than ever, I hope. And I think if it's done right, people will come. I'm real nervous about it. <laughs> Hoping people will like it. Hoping people will like the change because it's going to be a lot different. Maybe a touch of class, hopefully for once. I want to paint an eggplant. <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> It'll do. Egg it's work on it. Yeah, I'm thinking of a nice gray color. And I'm thinking eggplant it shall be. <laughs> <laughs> and when you drive down there on the 12th, eggplant it will be. <laughs> <laughs> We met at an Easter party over at a friend's house. A couple of gay girls that we know had a big Easter party. They do it just about every year. And uh, she was there with her girlfriend. I was single. I wasn't looking for anything, but she. <laughs> <laughs> By the door needs to be done with that little triangle back over there behind you. Let's see. Um, just like any heterosexual couple. We struggled to buy our first home together. We struggled to take care of a child together. We just have a little twist on it that people don't always want us here and people don't want to accept the fact that we are here, but we're here. <laughs> With a lot of dreaming and a lot of strength 
and vision and courage and someone willing to risk everything, literally, for everyone else. I think it's probably the proudest moment I've ever had. Um, it's the most selfless act. It's not about owning a bar. It's not about the money. It's about her creating an environment that we can go, we can pick up at the drop of the hat and go and be ourselves and not have to think about where we're going to go, where we're going to hide our cars, who we're going to hide from, if people are going to see us there. It's everything, everything to us. Being able to go in and not have to think of uh, a move or a gesture or a hug or a touch or to show who you really are. To be at ease, not to feel like you're scared and restricted. It worries me her being out there by herself some days. It concerns me a great deal, but it's just a chance and a risk that she's willing to take. I think that it is very important. I think it's necessary, and I think it's time. to open. Ready as we're going to be. Open for a lot of people and hope a lot of people are going to be real happy with what they see and I have people tell me I'm being brave by doing this. You know, everybody's been good and supportive and of course I'm nervous about getting out here and then going bust but I really don't think it will. I hope it doesn't. I think people are going to come and I hope they'll like it. Brings you out here tonight? Uh, grand opening, different seasons. I have been excited about this night for a long time. I have been waiting for this club to reopen. To me, it was like one of the best things I got since Christmas. They've totally redone the bar. It it looks phenomenal. The first people we seen was the owner and a couple of other friends of ours, and we all hugged necks, and it was just like basically like past the peas. You know what I'm saying? We were, it was like family. They deserve to dance on their own dance floor. Lori and Ruby, would you please come to the stage? What's life like here without the bar? It has been hard. I mean, a lot of people have been wondering, what do we do now? Where do we go? For me, it left a, a giant hole. We kind of dispersed. Some kind of stayed in touch. But for the most part, we just kind of lost touch a lot of times. Everybody missed that. They were probably sitting at home on the weekends instead of going out having a good time with friends. It's hard to live here in Meridian. Be gay. You're either one of the people who's brave enough to just stand out and say I'm gay regardless, or you have to be contented to be in the background because if you're not, there's a lot of prejudice, especially with like law enforcement and public officials, that they just are, I don't know why, that they're so scared of there being a gay population. It is nice to have a place that you can come to with your boyfriend or whomever, your significant other, and you really don't have to worry about the social prejudices of the South. It's hard to grow up here and worry about getting lynched every day. Here you don't have to worry about that. This is Mississippi, the 
part of the Bible Belt. Either you're part of that or you're condemned. If you don't like me, I don't like you, and we ain't got the deal no more. There are some people that, I don't know, the weaker, no, I wouldn't say weak, they're a little more timid than I am. So it takes, it, it bothers them more than me. If you don't like me, I, fuck you. <laughs> Basically, that's the way I live my life. It's nice to have a place to go. It's not a bunch of straight people sitting around. Nothing against straight people. It's not that. It's just you get tired of being a gay person and you have nowhere to go except a straight bar. You're sitting there and everybody's straight. And I hope that uh, the gay community here will come around and rally and support it because we really genuinely need somewhere to hang out and just have fun. It was like the heart of the place just stopped beating when Crossroads closed down. And when everyone heard that this one was reopening, it was just like the heart just called a second wind and started beating again. I mean, politics is against us. Society is against us. All we have is each other. That's all we have. When I heard this place was opening, you couldn't have stopped me from coming. I have too many memories here, and it means a lot. parking lot was no more parking left. Take it one day at a time and keep trying to do bigger and better things and maybe they'll keep coming through the door. Basically tonight's pretty much my last official night. We're still in the process of doing all our paperwork and transferring everything over. But tonight's my last night at the bar as far as ownership. <clears throat> I'll finish out tonight, I walk out with all my money and starting Thursday night, Mark and Lena take over. No last minute regrets at all. I'm ready. I honestly have no idea who to expect tonight because we've invited everybody we know. Yep, it's, tonight will probably be really emotional, so. To read. I want to start by saying thank you to everyone who has been here to support Rivers and me during the last seven years. It's been a long and eventful run and I look, for, I look back on the years with fondness and pride. Well, I play an important part in the history and life of this bar. I didn't do it alone. Everyone deserves credit and thanks for the part they played. To Lena and Mark, I want to say thank you for my freedom. <laughs> In case y'all were getting a bit confused, as some people do, this is Lena and this is Mark. I wish you all the best. Enjoy the adventures and save me a bar still because I'll be here to support our local gay bars. I hope our entire community will. All right, a crowd like this every fucking Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. <laughs> Now, regardless of where I go or what I do, rumors will always be a part of me, and a part of me will always be here with rumors. Thank you to everyone for a great ride. Love, great. Have a stool with your name on it next Our 
bar should be a place where everybody goes out to have fun, to relax. You know, we all have to deal with the same shit. So why make it harder on each other? And the bar should really be a place where everybody goes to let go and have a good time. We all have to have a support system, and that's where they get their support. They know they're welcome, they know they're wanted, and they know they're loved. And that's pretty much, that's how I see it. Give it up for your bar owner one last time. Give it up for Rick! Stitches out that we slowly left. Kept your uniform this time because I couldn't quit. I've been felt around so cold that I get it soon. Now I'm still your fat. I'm still. It's a possibility to live without this Then it's love to fill right up with all the broken kids I swore I'd drink your piss that night to see if I could live But my wrists couldn't stand the light that we missed And I'm still your fan What advice uh, would you give to somebody who found themselves gay? I would say uh, my advice is uh, you are going to hell and there's not anything you can do about it. Have a nice day.